live and it's being recorded. But welcome to Learning to Look. Welcome to Learning to Look. Thank you, Beth. We're learning to week. Whoops. <laughs> learning to Look is every other week. And in between, we have coffee with the curator. So uh, once a week, you can get art live art programming from the Patchogue Arts Council. I'm your host, John Sino, and I am very, very happy to be sharing the platform today with a dear friend, Eileen Palmer. Say hi, Thanks. Eileen. <laughs> hey, hi, Eileen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So a couple of weeks ago, I was working on another presentation, and I got to the point where I wanted to include a few uh, women artists from the 1960s and 70s. And the next thing I knew, I said, this is going to be so much that I'm going to need help. So I, I immediately reached out to Eileen to see if she wanted to do this do this with me. And as we started thinking about the historical perspective, I realized it was going to take two sessions to do this. So um, today we're going to do oh, up into the early 1900s and then uh, the last hundred years will happen two weeks from today. So um, Eileen is, is so, a- So we have- yeah. What, 7,000 7, years of, of art history to cover in the next 55 minutes. Yeah, Can we, we go. <laughs> yeah, we go. But now I'd like you, you know, to know that Eileen is a, um, does tours as, as a docent. Have you been a docent at um, Brooklyn Museum? Mm, uh, no, I'm not, I, I was never a docent. I was uh, in the uh, adult services uh, department. At one point, I helped oversee the docent program. So oh, that's, okay. That that's not. I mean, well, I, I. The I used point to is, bring, you worked at the Brooklyn. Museum. I, I did. I worked at the Brooklyn Museum, and I helped develop programs, and I also uh, helped develop programs for people with dementia and Alzheimer's. Okay. So I've, I have led groups through the Brooklyn Museum. And as we are, yes, and I've been in one of those groups. It's a lot of fun um, for Frida Kahlo. Um, and uh, one of the most famous pieces at the Brooklyn Museum is the dinner party. Right? So uh, Eileen is very familiar with this work and she wants to begin by telling us about the dinner party. What, what, what's interesting about the dinner party and this talk is that the dinner party is a compilation of women through history. It celebrates all, all uh, women from pre prehistory up until uh, the 19, up until Georgia O'Keeffe, the 1920s, or, or if you want to consider when she passed. So we, John came up with the great idea, maybe we can just use, this is not about the dinner party, but it's using the dinner party as a segue and kind of a symbol of uh, women in visual art history. So that's, that's where we're starting. And so, you, uh, so I'll tell you something about the dinner party. Um, it is my favorite exhibit in the exhibition in the uh, Brooklyn Museum and well worth the visit into Brooklyn, even for you people in California or wherever <laughs> you're from. Uh, it's, it's a huge installation. Um, it's, it, it's a renowned piece of feminine art, uh, feminist artwork done by Judy Chicago. It was done in the early 70s. And like I said, it was to commemorate women in history because the Western canon really uh, does not celebrate them the way they should be. And she felt that this would be a, a very a visual and uh, experiential way to introduce people to a lot of a lot of the women that had impact on the world. Oh, the when you walk into the room, what, what it is, it's a huge triangular table setting and it's it's 48 feet by 48 feet by 48 feet um it's got 13 everything's symbolic in this it's it's it, when you see it it's just awe-inspiring even if you don't know what's going on but i'll tell you a little bit about what's going on uh there's three sides to the table the table is like you can see a triangle triangle is symbolic of uh, the female, uh, as you can see from, you could figure that out yourself. Um, and they break it down into three different periods. 
The first side is prehistory to the class to classical Rome. Uh, the second side is Christianity to the Reformation, and the third side is the uh, American Revolution to the Women's Revolution. So we're going to we're not going to be talking specifically about each person that's represented in as uh, that's being fed at, at the table, but we're going to bring you through his uh, art history and introduce you to a lot of different artists who've been in that period. Um, the, if you look at the picture on the top right, I mean, top left, uh, that's the hallway. And there are these five, five foot by three foot beautiful banners. And you're led in through a very thin red uh, hallway, uh, which is symbolic if, like a female symbolism. Then you're uh, entered into the, the room with the huge table and the table has 39 different place settings. Uh, the place settings are just amazing. They're all, um, they're symbolic of each of the women they represent and they're also f femininely symbolic. Um, I don't know, if you if you could see the pictures, you could see that there there's vulvar uh, symbolism in them. So you, it's it's pretty obvious when you look at them, and it's it's a sight to be seen. So I don't see, should we should we go? Well, I would like you know we could talk a little bit more about it. You know, um, like for instance, besides having the the plate, each one has the the uh, the, the cloth, the table setting. Right, that's embroidered, right? And um, there was a group of a group of artists who worked on this project. And um, when I was a student, was when this was was first seen, and it created a lot. There was a lot of controversy about it, and it had to do with. I, I think it had a lot to do with about gender politics at that time and what we what we thought was acceptable in the way of art. And when she made this, um, working with a collective was not a popular way of working. We were coming out of the period of abstract expressionism and minimalism and these, these kind of macho statements and like this heroic artwork like earthworks and stuff like that and all of this type of work was based on kind of like the the individual heroic statement and then she made this piece where she worked with lots of other artists and um I remember the critique, the biggest negative critique about it had to do with the fact that, well, she didn't really do it all, you know, that she worked with, you know, that other people helped her make it. And, uh, you know, at that time, that was an argument that that was popular. We don't make that argument anymore. So yeah, she was important in in breaking down that idea that that an artwork is always done by an individual. Also, to give credit to the collective, I think uh, I, throughout history, I have no doubt that collectively people have made certain works, but because perhaps they were done uh, by men, they weren't given the credit. Uh, I don't know, but that's just just a thought that could. <clears throat> so in, in this, there was 129 people that helped helped her do all the, the different things that uh, were involved in this, and everyone is given credit at the end. Well, it's really amazing. It really was. And I remember it was my first trip to the Brooklyn Museum to, to see this piece. And, and it was there for a little while and then they put it away. Uh, and uh, only some 20 or 30 years later did it get a permanent uh, home. Right. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. Um, I, I think that it was groundbreaking and it was um, really important for the art world to have this work being produced because now I, you know, you, you go, you go for a grant and there's category, you know, are you an individual or are you a group is part of the, uh, the questions they ask about it. So, um, you know, now it's a different way of thinking about work that working as a collective is an acceptable way. 
been, but at this point it hadn't been. Well, anyway, um, the the work, um, as Eileen said, is has a historical um, progression to it. And the very first um, plate, as we can see here, is the uh, primordial goddess. But the second plate then is the fertility goddess. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, um, the mythology surrounding women in in, in art um, in in the prehistoric and Neolithic times in the in the past, and I like to think of it as the mythic past, right? So the fertility goddess is the second um, second plate, and um, during thousands and thousands of years, there were sculptures that were made of women. Um, the most famous one being the the woman or Venus of Willendorf. Um, these pieces are very small, they're portable, they're meant to be handled um, and obviously handled by many people, right? So, um, you know, we don't have an exact idea of what the function was because they are prehistoric. There's no words about them, but something about the, the, the form, um, leads people to believe that they had to do with birthing and nurturing and supporting of children, right? So the fertility was was the key way back then. Now, this isn't really the very first of these pieces. It certainly is the most famous. And uh, the Brooklyn Museum also has a much older piece, some 10,000 years older. And it's actually made of clay. This is one that Eileen is familiar with, right? Yeah. She, She's she's called female figure, but she's lovingly known as the bird lady. Uh, this was probably my most favorite object in the Brooklyn Museum. She's about the size of a Barbie doll, and she's made of terracotta clay. Uh, she's only wearing a white skirt. Her her face is shaped like a bird, and her hands are up in the air. And they. The interesting, she's she's very mysterious. The interesting thing about her is they don't know whether she's keening, uh, mourning somebody, or she's jubilant. They don't know if she's wearing a mask or if she's a, a goddess, a half woman, half bird. So she's she's a bit of a mystery, but the biggest mystery to me is how something so delicate and beautiful could that make made out of clay could still be around it's just yeah. pretty incredible it's truly amazing and in a little bit we're going to see how clay um is important in some of the first work that we know is being attributed to women um uh uh, I have this other Venus figure that's really fascinating here, right? And, and in this one, you notice she's holding up a horn and the horn has notches in it. This is a work that I had first seen through the, the writings on mythology of Joseph Campbell. And um, what, what he theorized from this piece was that the woman is holding the crescent, right? The crescent, the symbol of the moon and the, and the cyclical nature of women's cycles, right? So um, he brought the idea that this is an awareness of uh, cyclical and regular time and recording of time. So this piece, which is about um, 20,000 years old, um, you know, seems to be where people are really becoming aware of how to record time. And again, it's through it's through the the feminine that this happens. Let's see what's next. Okay, so uh, some thousands of years later, we enter the Neolithic period, and the Neolithic period is the time in which we switch from hunting and gathering to farming, and we still see the persistence uh, of the mother goddess here, and um, that little sculpture would have been found, it was actually found in the temple to the right, um, and I put two different Neolithic temples up here so we can see a little bit about the experience, right? So obviously uh, the one on the right, you enter into a dark space, right? And um, when you compare that to the one on the left that has its top removed, its top would have been made of wood and, you know, uh, 
tree trunks and, and grasses and stuff like that, and it would have been uh, covered over. So you would have entered in through the same kind of portal and entered into a figure that is essentially um, a reminiscent of the of the Venus of Willendorf, the fertility figurine, right? So going in to this figure is going into the mother, coming out again is to be born, right? That's the symbolism that that is involved with these pieces and this architecture actually. So um, um, this idea of going in to the, into the mother is also symbolic of going into the earth, right? And we find that the, the mother and, and earth are connected and the animal that is um, of the earth, one of the, the one that we associate with the earth is the snake, right? So we see the snake goddess here, right? The snake goddess who handles the creatures of the earth. Now, it's a curious thing about, uh, about this piece because we're seeing this Minoan snake uh, goddess and she's really powerful and she's holding the snakes and we know that like she's part of this whole system of, of, of nurturing and birth and fertility and, and, and um, and what happened to her, right? What happened to this woman who was holding the snakes? Well, we all know what happened to the snakes. They went from being part of this woman's uh, power to becoming an evil symbol in some later, uh, in some later mythological periods, right? And um, part of, when I see that happening for me, that seems to be the switching over from the the uh, kind of the uh, the kind of uh, the praise of the feminine, uh, the divine feminine, and one of a masculine overpowering the feminine, right? So um, we see that happening kind of in the Neolithic period into the early, into the early ancient world, right? And um, I think Ju Judy Chicago kind of highlights that in her plate of Sophia. All right, uh, it's coming up. Okay. <laughs> right. And um, Sophia, uh, you know, um, I first thought of of the, the Parthenon because it's it's very similar in format to this. But when you look at the Parthenon, of course, um, the Parthenon is dedicated to the goddess Athena, who is the goddess of many things, but amongst the things that she's the goddess of is wisdom. But the Greeks have this way of like shifting entities. So not only was Athena the goddess of wisdom, but we also have Sophia as the goddess of wisdom, right? So we see that here. Um, and if you think about Turkey and how, um, you know, in the news right now is a Hagia Sophia is in the news. Um, it's essentially uh, was created as a, as a Christian church as the divine wisdom, right? And of course, wisdom is feminine here, right? Okay. Well, um, you know, uh, after after that kind of super period of patriarchy, and we we enter into the Christian era, there is there is a a, a dearth of feminine symbolism for a number of centuries until there becomes this uh, new worship of the Virgin, right? So uh, she then picks up where those earlier. Uh, feminine deities left off. Now, this is one of the few um, actual historic uh, figures that I put in this section, Empress Theodora, because she's really an amazing person, right? And if you don't know her story, she's a, a Byzantine uh, woman. She was um, at first in her life a courtesan, and the Emperor Justinian um, was enamored with her. They, they were married and uh, she became his closest advisor. And after a while, she became co-empress with Emperor Justinian. And then after Justinian died, she was then the sole empress of the uh, Byzantine Empire. And in that position, she um, lobbied regularly for women's rights. So uh, she's an interesting historical figure. And she is, um, oh, I thought I had her on here, but I guess I didn't put her plate in. She, she, um, 
I thought she has a plate at uh, at the table of Judy Chicago as well. Okay, so anyway, you know, looking at this, this um, um, Mary symbolism continues for centuries and millennia, right? And we're looking all the way up into, into more recent times here. But I want to close this section off by showing you um, what when we talked about that entering into and exiting and birthing and, and all of that sort of stuff that we talk about with the divine feminine, um, it is implicit even into the Middle Ages, right? And um, when you think of, uh, of a cathedral um, and you hear that it's named Notre Dame, what is it actually being named but Our Lady? And so what are you doing? You're entering into Our Lady and then fulfilling whatever rituals that go with this and then you're coming out and being reborn again so that that is a you know it is a feminine um you know the divine feminine in action over thousands of years okay well that's the mythological period and uh i want to now talk about um actual works being created by women, right, rather than just of women. Okay, and the very first, um, the very first uh, time that we we can find that this stuff is all very fascinating to me, and I've just been spending weeks looking things up and finding out things I didn't know. So I've been fascinated. But um, uh, there, in a recent in an article I read recently, I found out that in um, ancient Minoa, right, um, a skeleton was exhumed, and it was a woman, and um, they noticed certain wear on the skeletal, uh, you know, joints, and they tried to figure out what that's what that was all about, and they tested it against all the different types of activities that women would have been involved in, and none of them put the wear on the skeleton like that, so they expanded it to some of the things that men did. And lo and behold, what they found out was that the wear on this skeleton was in line with this. She was a right-handed potter. And um, so they attribute to a, a thousand uh, BC, 3,000 years ago, that, you know, they've got this skeleton of a woman that they know was a ceramist, right? That's kind of fascinating. 500 years later, we actually have a visual depiction of a woman potter from, um, from a piece of Greek pottery. Now, this is a very famous mosaic, right? And um, it was originally a painting, and um, but um, the painter was originally um, thought to be a man, but as time went on, uh, an archaeologist discovered that this painting was um, done by a woman, the original painting of the uh, Battle of Alexander. Right? So this, again, is, is, a, is a work that is pre-Christian in its original origin as a painting, and um, was we don't see the original. We only see it in the mosaic copies that have been made from it. Right. So these are also um, also works that are not original in any way. Well, they can be original, but um, in a different sense. What um, what these three images depict are three of the six female artists who were who were recorded by Pliny the Elder in AD 77. So he had made a list of remarkable people. And in that he included um, a number of women, six of them being artists, right? And these are medieval representations of three of those artists, right? So we do have this documentation. We don't have any of their work. We know nothing of what their work looked like, but we do know that there were these um, women who were actually painters in around the time of Christ. 
So um, going forward sometime, we get to uh, the Middle Ages. And in the Middle Ages, again, we're seeing a piece of embroidery right? and the idea of collective, this famous piece, the Bayou Tapestry, right? that many people learn about um, in, art, in art history, the, which depicts the Battle of Hastings. I believe this is the Norman conquest of, of, um, of um, England, right? And so that's all displayed out on here. But the piece is is um, an embroidered, and obviously the work of women. I'm getting weather reports all over mm. the place here. Uh, I wonder if they're coming up. Do you see them, those weather reports on my screen? Are they showing up? Okay, well, anyway, like um, we really don't uh, know, um, how people got into making art, but one of the ways in the Middle Ages that that people were trained was in monasteries, right? And and we tend to think of monks doing um, a lot of manuscript illumination, but there were also women who were in their um, monasteries, and they too were doing illustrations as well. This, this is a page from um, one of the earliest known um, manuscripts that has been attributed to a, um, a woman. And this, this is in Spain. So Spain had, was coming out of that period of time when it was under the Islamic empire. And it was really considered a really, um, you know, kind of intellectual place. Uh, a lot of activity went on there. So um, two of those nuns who were doing um, manuscript illumination in the Middle Ages actually made portraits of them, put themselves into parts of their work. And we so we do know about them here. If you look to the left, you see the word Gouda. That's the name of the nun who, who made uh, this manuscript, or at least this portion of this manuscript and the letter D, right? Clarica turned herself into a Q, right? Over here as well too. Now, now um, rarely do you know about the actual people who, who made these manuscripts, usually the only people you would know are the, the abbot or the abbess who, who were in charge of it. So these people would have been um, the, ab the abbess of, of, a, um, of a monastery. But the most famous of all of these is Hildegard. And I know that Eileen knows, wanted to talk a little bit about Hildegard. Was that true? Yes, Hildegard of Bingen. She's a very interesting uh, person in history. She was, she was, a, she was sainted. She is known as Saint Hildegard. She was an abbess, and she was a she was a mystic, a scientist, a theologian. Uh, she she even had connections with the Pope. The Pope would would uh, she and the Pope would just discuss different things, and he would take her counsel. Or, or so I've read, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> so she she had a lot of influence for a female at the time, and she also opened up. Uh, she paved the way for other women also to uh, excel in the sciences and in and the arts at that time. I think this is her. Yeah, I mean her. You know, you look at her work; it's it's real. It's beautiful and intricate. I mean, and you know, like I think about, you know, when you think about mystic art, right? You know, this is like really. Uh, this could be psychedelic. This could be. Sure, I mean, you, you have this beautiful things. mandala that it's just. <laughs> I mean, it's mesmerizing just to look at it. Right. That's why I put that in there. I just, you know, to see that this this was uh, this piece was made a thousand years ago or more. You know, is is really fascinating, and and it, it just it just blows your mind away. That, you know that that they were working like this on these little manuscripts. So um, both of these two are actual reproductions that other people made of Hildegard's work, right? And um, I know that Eileen was mentioning something about the universal man because someone else did that too, right? 
<laughs> if you, I think if you go go to the next slide, you'll see. <laughs> yeah, <of course. laughs> I just I thought this was interesting. Um, Hildegard died in 1179, and the Vitruvian Man was done in 1490. I, they, they hmm, <laughs> looks. I mean, may, maybe it maybe it's a, a symbol that's used was used frequently, but it seems there. It seems like uh, Da Vinci was definitely inspired by Bingen, but. Mm. Well, you know, there's this whole tradition of sacred geometry that goes back to the Middle Ages, and um, and you know, it never it never really went away. You can see it in in artists working right up into the 20th century, uh, dealing with that. And we'll look at uh, uh, some Hilma Afklint, Klimt. You know, she used the ideas of sacred geometry in her work as well too. So we'll see that in a moment. Well, um, these are, this is the medieval period, right? And of, of course, following the, the medieval period is the Renaissance, right? And um, in my research, I came upon uh, Properzia de Rossi, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is amazing, you know? I didn't really know much about her at all, but she is um, active, you know, the same time as Leonardo and Michelangelo and her work is, you know, is, you know, incredibly uh, uh, sophisticated, right? And why is it that we never heard of her before? <laughs> well, part of that has to do with the way we're educated or we were educated all us older people, you know, um, there were very few women in, in, in the in the courses when I took them and I had to, uh, you know, I was having fun just looking up and seeing how many, how many people I can find. So um, the work on the right is a, a artist depiction of, of, of her uh, uh, revealing one of her works. She did all sorts of um, relief sculpture. And, um, Oftentimes, when women were working in, in the Renaissance, it's, it has to be understood that the, one of the reasons why it was hard for women to become artists was the way that artists were educated, right? Um, starting in this period uh, and right through the Baroque, and we'll, we'll talk more about it probably when we get to Artemisia, um, a artist was trained by, by living in the household of another artist and they would begin by doing menial tasks and, and that artist would train them a little bit and they would get more and more um, skilled and eventually um, they, they would be allowed to work on the paintings with their master and uh, sooner or later they would make a single work of art that was considered their masterpiece. And when you made a masterpiece, then you were able to, you know, join the guild as a full-fledged artist. But the whole issue behind all of that is that um, uh, the training was almost always in a man's household. And it was not a good idea to submit your daughter to an, to another man's household, you know, so that, that was highly frowned upon. So rarely, you know, one of the things that kept women back was this kind of education system. And we'll find that a lot of the uh, artists during the Renaissance were, were, um, were trained by their parents. Um, Katerina uh, has a self-portrait and when you look back into these works you find that lot, lots of lots of the women in this period you know we see their self-portraits and they are often portrait artists as we can see here and much less um, time we actually see them making paintings like the religious painting you see on the right. It's probably because they were commissions and they weren't getting those commissions. Oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now, now this woman from Flanders actually went off to to um, the court of Henry the Eighth and became um, his court painter. So she ended up uh, gaining uh, gaining a, a, a lot of reputation. Um, Lavinia Terlich. And in Italy, one of the the, the first um, major painters. Uh, uh, I'm going to try to say her name. Sofanzoba <laughs> Angiulzola. 
that was probably terrible. Well, anyway, and as you can see, she's making portraits. She's making self-portraits, right? And um, family scenes that we see here, more self-portraits. That, ch that child's face is just precious. I love that one. So, These are her sisters. That's the three sisters, yeah, in, in this work and their, their maid servant and they're playing chess. Now, um, um, she's, she, um, she's often found in, in textbooks now, but I discovered this woman, Sister uh, Plotilla Nelly, right? And um, she's making paintings that are very similar to what you would see by, by the, the Renaissance male painters of the time. And um, recently it was discovered that she made a Last Supper. Right, so um, you know when we think about all the all the different examples of the Last Supper, no one ever shows us this one, right? And I've done that before, where I've I've shown a whole series of Last Suppers, and uh, until last week, I didn't know that this one existed. And there it is in the Basilica Santa Maria Novella now. Okay. It takes such digging to find these. It's interesting somebody yeah. with the depth of knowledge that you have that it actually took a, a lot of scholarly research. I mean, you could just name people off the top of your head. I've seen you do that. It's, and, <laughs> and to, to just not have that as part of, as part of our canon is kind of speaks for itself. But. Yeah. You know, like the things that I remember are the things that I learned a long time ago. <laughs> you know, I forget a lot of the early, the more recent stuff. So, so uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, you have to constantly be teaching yourself, you know, and that's one of the things that uh, I've always enjoyed doing and why I like doing this because I'm just looking up all of these different, um, different, whatever the subject is, I'm learning more about it all the time. Right. Well, I, I'm not an expert in the Renaissance, and certainly uh, this portion of the Renaissance, which is not, you know, a well known, isn't my my uh, forte. But I did want to show you some of the women who were working during the Renaissance. So these are the Italians, and um, uh, of course, um, the portrait on the left seems to be uh, kind of whimsical. It's actually a representational portrait of a print of a of a young gal who did have an extremely hairy face, and it was passed <laughs> down to her from her father. And there were other children in the family, and only she inherited from her father that 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 kind of look. So. Um, so it's a um, it's actually a, a sweet uh, portrait in in the end there. Now, um, leaving the Renaissance, we enter the Baroque period, and of course, we're going to see one of the most famous examples of Judith uh, with the head of Holofernes in just a minute. But even earlier than Artemisia, there were other women who started to work in and. Um, in the Baroque period and covered this very popular topic. Uh, Fede Galizia also is, has one of the early still lifes that is nothing but pure fruit, right? You know, so, uh, um, you know, usually they had to have more uh, complexity and symbolism in them, but just making this simple um, still life of fruit was almost groundbreaking when it was made. Now, the the star of the Baroque period in terms of women is Artemisia Gentilici, right? And Eileen knows, uh, I think, wanted to say some stuff here. Did you? Uh, when, we, when you get to uh, Judith and... Uh, the, the Judith painting. Okay, but. sure. I'll bring that up in a second. I did this one because I wanted to show you that she got into the, um, she also got into uh, Judy Chicago's dinner party. And uh, this is the self-portrait of, uh, of her. She, um, I'm going to leave that off, the story off. And if, if, if Eileen misses something, I'll come back and talk about that. And, um, some of the paintings that she made, uh, you recognize um, that she always has very strong and important female heroines in her work. Yes, Eileen? It's the Judas slaying Holofernes. It's just a, a very uh, powerful portrait. 
her, her treatment of the women is is pretty amazing. You just look at the strength and the concentration that they have. The the story behind this is um, Holofernes was a was he a king or a general, and he was uh, waging war against um, Judith's people. So they took it into their own hands and uh, executed his demise. But it's it's a it's a a trope that's been through, done through history and a lot of different artists have done it. And to see how this woman has portrayed it, uh, it's just, a, it's, it's a real, you could just see this, this strong feminine uh, willpower behind the painting. So, so um, Artemisia was a, was trained by her father who was a, a follower of Caravaggio and that dark uh, background and the bright light coming from a single dramatic source as we can see in the painting on the right um, is is uh, Caravaggesque style, right? So um, her father was off on an errand to paint a commission and uh, Artemisia was left at home and uh, her father asked one of her, one of his friends, to look after Artemisia. And um, he did look after Artemisia, perhaps a little bit too closely, and um, he he raped her, right? And so Artemisia actually sued um, sued this man and you know and it's it's the first time that uh, um, uh, that a suit was brought up by a woman in a case like this and and uh, so um, that was a very um, important part of her life and from that point on virtually all of her works are about female heroines you can see that throughout the previous pictures also where yeah you, you can see it, it comes from somebody that that has a almost a, a deep wound inside and then she's she's kind of standing on her own feet and as an artist and using and using these uh particular Susanna and the elders you know she's using that to get those feelings out that that she's probably bottled up inside so i think the the last i i found this an interesting comparison on the right is Caravaggio's uh, mm -hmm. Judith, and to compare it to Artemisia's is it's an interesting thing. It, you you'll see, it, it's kind of like the difference between the female gaze and the male gaze. So Judith is is very almost. I mean, she's she's slicing his head off, but she's almost demure <laughs> in Caravaggio's. She's she's a lady. She's dressed in white. She's you know she's clean. She's standing back. From the action, and in in uh, Artemisia's, th yeah. these two gals are are right. They're really into it. digging in, yeah. yeah. They're, <laughs> they're really taking care of business. I, mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with Gustav Klimt's Judith, and that's almost uh, there's this beautiful, seductive woman, bare chested, and the head of Holofernes is is almost not even shown in the painting. So it's it's interesting. W mm. where you're coming from, how you portray that. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Good point. Okay. And a couple of other of her pieces. Um, in, 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 in Flanders, uh, still life was a very important uh, field, and we tend to think about the the, the men who worked on still lifes, but uh, but um, in, there were just as many women who were active in this period working on still life. Some really, I mean, when you look at this work, it's it's like you know, uh, it's incredible. And by the way, the next week I'll be talking to Jane Hartley, who is a realist painter who. This is her work on Baroque still life paintings. So, uh, we'll be talking next week. But I mean, these works are just truly amazing in, in their technical scope. And in France as well.
Now, Judith Leister has an interesting story. Eileen, did you I, have? I, did you? I thought you said you were. No, I just I, I love her work. I, okay, I well, at, tell I us why at, you love it. That's it. That's <laughs> I can tell. I can't. I, I'm not good with the history, but I can tell you why. I just you, you look at these characters and you just say, you know, I want to hang out with this gal. Uh, it's just it, the 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 joy and the ruddiness and and, uh, and the action that she brings to her paintings. Uh, is is pretty amazing. Um, I think she was a, a protege of Franz Hals, if I if I'm correct. And yes, I, she worked I, in his studio. I do believe that he actually uh, put his his own name on some of her works. If I could be wrong, but yeah, well, that's what I was going to bring up. Yes, so so many many of her works were originally attributed to Franz Hals. Right. And again, it's that whole thing of like, you know, the uh, the the men are in charge and the women have to take what they can get from it. Uh, an English uh, uh, portraitist from the same time, Mary Beale. And the still life artist, Rachel Rush, right, whose works are really, really exquisite and, and um, uh, just so so very lush um, a very interesting woman of the same time is Maria Marianne who is took that idea of the realism to the point of becoming a, essentially a scientist and producing all of these um, folios of the evolution, you know, the metamorphosis of insects and, and plants and stuff like that. So she was a, a early nat a naturalist and took that idea of that close study that we saw in the still lifes and really turned it into a science. So we're entering into the 1700s now, and uh, let's see how far we can get. Um, Rose Alba is a famous portraitist again. I, I think she was one of the pioneers of uh, using uh, pastels in, in portraiture, which is then, and it kind of took off after she was using it. She's got an interesting backstory. Uh, she started making lace in her family's, in her family's business. And when that wasn't going well, she went into miniatures and uh, snuff boxes were very popular. So she would do little miniatures on top of snuff boxes. And then that morphed into paintings and, and then her career took off. Oh. But I mean, you could see in the picture on the right, you can see it, that's a self portrait and you could just kind of see the, the feeling of the woman, how she's just like looking straight on at, at you composed, uh, very confident, and showing off her sweet sister. <laughs> okay, that's a sister. All right, they look so much alike. Another woman who ended up working with pastels, right? Uh, Virgie Lebrun, right? Um, she was a, a, an extremely popular portrait painter in the later 1700s. And of course, this is the time of the, the uh, French Revolution, right? So uh, she was called upon to make a painting of Marie Antoinette, right? M uh, multiple paintings. But uh, what was happening between 1783 and 1787 was the, um, the French Revolution was heating up, right? And the aristocracy was getting, and, and the nobility were, were, were becoming, um, becoming um, more and more despised by the common people. So um, what ended up happening was Vigil Lebrun, uh, Lebrun had to make a painting of Maria Antoinette as a good mother, right? This is like uh, the you know those you know those pictures we see here right. little, <laughs> of Melania little, little Trump little being propaganda. yes, right? This is like here we have this uh, you know because she was really a decadent person, and you know um, you know the the peasants have no bread to eat. You know, uh, that's a the let them eat cake. So anyway, um, Lebron, uh, Vigie Lebron made these paintings. And because she was associated with, with 
you know, the court, when she painted these, she went into exile and she painted more paintings in Italy and Russia, and then ev eventually came back to uh, France later on. Now, um, here we have another artist who, you know, I didn't know about until until a, a week or two ago, uh, Adelaide Labille-Guillard, right? And she is one of the first women to be allowed into the Royal Academy. You know, so we're, we're at a time now where the apprenticeship program is over and you would be getting, you know, your education through an academy and uh, eventually, uh, when you were a successful artist, you would be able to show with the academicians, the, the, the fully trained artist, right? So she was one of those artists and she's sitting here. It's a little bit later after, she, after that period because now she actually has her own students who are behind her, right? And she was an advocate for, uh, for uh, women being allowed into the academy and, and um, being trained, right? So um, kind of a fascinating woman in her own right. Another woman at the same time who was not in the French Academy, but in the English Academy was Angelica Kaufman. She originated in, in Switzerland, but she had moved to England. And she was, um, she was a proponent of what became known as neoclassicism. Right? So it's obviously reminiscent of all of the, these uh, classical era paintings. Right? And they're often having a very moralistic tone to them. Right? And as we see in Cornelia pointing to her children. So um, Cornelia is the woman in the middle and uh, this other lady is visiting her and she's showing off her jewelry. And she says to Cornelia, well, where are your jewels? And Cornelia says, um, these, these two over here are my, my, um, my jewelries and my jewels. And these two boys would end up becoming heroes in the Roman empire. So uh, it's kind of like a moralizing story. And that's what um, neoclassicism was all about. And um, she was one of the few women who were in the, aca the academies who were able to produce these paintings. So these academies existed all over Europe by this point. And uh, the, in Germany, Maria Ellen Ryder was the first woman to enter into the art academy there as well too. So, you know, um, it was a hard, you know, these, these are all trailblazer women who are, who are working in this period. Now, about 30 or 40 years later, we have Rosa Bonhauer, who, if there was ever a trailblazer of a woman, um, she's painting in the period known as realism in France, and she's painting these, these are enormous paintings, like this one's in, at the Met, it's like 20 feet across, right, and um, um, uh, she's painting these powerful animals, and of course, at this period of time, it was thought that, you know, women's uh, constitution wasn't capable of of dealing with this this all the strength that these animals had. Rosa did something very interesting though. Like she got into this horse fair. This is where the horses would be being sold and um, no women were allowed. So for Rosa to get inside this place to make her sketches for this painting, she had to dress as a man. Right? and allow, you know, and, and present as a man to be able to make these paintings. So there, there were sculptresses as well at this time working in the neoclassical style in both France and the United States. And here's two examples of them. Uh, and the most famous of that of this group is Maria Edmonia Lewis, right? an African American woman who probably the first African American sculptor known. Uh, 
Definitely, you know, definitely the first per female African American woman, well, female African American, to um, to. I mean, making sculpture is is a is a sizable task, and you have to have a lot of of like, you know, you know, you just don't make a sculpture. You know, you have to These have this big stone and move right. it, and you know, so so it's it's very impressive, but um, I like. Other people of her of her heritage and her time, she couldn't do this in the United States, right? So she went to Rome to to work, you know, and uh, became very successful working in in Rome. The, the top, the one on the top left is the uh, Death of Cleopatra, I believe, and it was commissioned for one of the. Um, the expositions uh, it was the centennial exposition in Philadelphia, and, and I think like af after that she just kind of she she just kind of died out. And when she went to Rome, she was working in Rome, and then her her work just just disappeared. I it's there was an interesting story about that particular piece. Um, somebody from the Met got a call that they had found it in a uh, warehouse in Chicago. And they went in, not believing it. They went into this 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 old shopping center warehouse. They open up the room, and there's this massive marble, beautiful sculpture, uh, with Christmas decorations and all store <laughs> ephemera or all, all around it. So that's that that statue there has had uh, has been around, has an interesting history. Thank you. So um, in the, in the eighteen hundreds also was the beginning of photography, and uh, there are women who are just as active in in photography as men. And this is really the birth of photography, circa eighteen fifty, when you see uh, Bertha Werner Beckman's work, right um, from eighteen fifty, and these. Uh, women who were working in these really early photographic styles, they were just as brave as any as the men and they went around and they traveled and like um, some of them did incredible stuff like Sophia Hoare, right? She went and, and uh, uh, documented uh, these, uh, uh, the, uh, the Pacific Islands and, and took photographs of people living there. So, you know, these are real trailblazer people, these women that we've never seen before. Uh, Julia Margaret Cameron is usually considered the, the you know, like the, uh, the, the most successful of all female photographers from this area. And she, she was noted for m making lots of portraits and also for some works that were um, softer as like the kiss of peace you know they're they're not just um uh portraits right the work on the left is a portrait but she also went to india and photographed there as well too so um we're getting we're we're reaching towards the modern time here and and of course we're all familiar with the impressionists um you know mary cassatt uh who comes from the United States and 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 works alongside uh, 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 Monet and Degas and the whole gang over there? Mary Cassatt, um, also a also a printmaker, and uh, as you move later into her career, her work starts to border on post impressionism. Um, Berthe Morisot, another one, and and a woman who was working there and. Um, Impressionism was a a a uh, form of painting that was very domestic. You know, domestic images were were popular in it, so it seemed to be an easy access for women at this point to work in in this in this field. So you know, usually we just don't know um, those two, but there were others as well as. You know, and here's examples of two more, Marie Brachamond and Eva Gonzalez, more impressionist painters. And a symbolist painter, right, from England uh, during the time of the Pre-Raphaelites, you know, um, you, uh, uh, an English woman making these uh, symbolist paintings. And sculptors, right? <laughs> you know, so uh, late in the in the nineteenth century, um, these very express um, 
impressionistic sculptors, uh, the Russian uh, Anna Golubinka and uh, Camille Claudel, who was the um, the mistress of Auguste Rodin, um, made sculpture in her own right. She ended up um, having some mental duress and um, stopped working after after a while. Uh, photog photographers again at the end of the of the century, um, photographing. Uh, Native Americans is Gertrude Kaisberg and um, taking atmospheric portraits as well. And um, as we can see here, uh, she made this portrait of Rosie, Rose O'Neill. I'm calling her Rosie. She, I feel like I know this person. Right? <laughs> she, this, this is such an intimate portrait of this woman who seems to be right, right in our time. It's truly amazing. So I had to look her up. I had to find out who was this woman, right? And I found out that Rose O'Neill was a cartoonist at the turn of the past century, right? And um, was most noted uh, for the depictions of the Cupid doll, which she created, which went on to become um, a, a very popular children's toy and, and character and like the most famous of all cartoon character until uh, Mickey Mouse came around. So um, this is the work of Rose O'Neill. So we're into the beginning of the 20th century now, and uh, it's the art period of Art Nouveau, the late 19th and early 20th century. And um, Eileen? Uh, two, two sisters, Margaret and Frances McDonald, were uh, very prominent in this, uh, in, in this milieu. They, they were kind of pioneers in the Art Nouveau, art nouveau style. Um, it's, it, it's real, it's a beautiful style. It's, uh, 19th century. It just, it just emerged in Europe and it kind of used plant-like forms and very geometric shapes. Just. Right. So we're, 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 many of us would be more familiar with the works of an artist like Gustav Klimt, but we can see here that, um, in a comparison between Klimt and, uh, uh, Margaret McIntosh. It was it, it was interesting. They when the McIntosh sisters started doing their work, they started becoming uh, pretty popular, and their work was selling. They were invited to Vienna by Gustav Klimt, and uh, got a number of commissions. Um, I always thought that it was interesting to you look at the one on the left that Margaret McDonald McIntosh did in 1906, and then you look at the famous portrait of Adele Blockbauer, pretty similar. He did a few years later, whether they were influenced, he was influenced by the uh, McDonald sisters. I, I would say that he was, but maybe they were doing it in tandem. Yeah, you know, it's pretty close. And, and you know, they were looking at the Byzantine art you know that that Empress Theodora and stuff like that, the the mosaics and the gold and all of that, and it was fairly common. I'm not sure whether this is the first work that Gustav Klimt made in this manner, but it certainly is the most famous. And I'm not, we're not sure whether this is the first one that uh, uh, Margaret made in this way either. So, um, but they were influential um, designers at the turn of the century, right? Um, uh, another artist whose whose career spanned the, the two centuries is Susan Valadon, right? But uh, her career changed drastically from one from the 1800s to the 1900s. Yeah, she started out as a model. Uh, I think she modeled for Degas and uh, Toulouse Lautrec and even Renoir. And then she started painting and kind of developed her own style. You can see the styles of the people that she modeled for uh, reflected in, in her work. Uh, her, her work in particularly shows female, like she has a lot of respect for the female figure. You see, they're not, they're not stylized, they're, they're real women. They're sitting there in, in kind of awkward positions and, uh, you know, comf and still comfortable in their own bodies. Uh, I look at the one on the on the left, and I see the the, ga the gals 
She's got her pile of books at the end of the bed. She's got a cigarette in, in, in her hand or in her mouth. Yep, in her mouth. And it, just a, a very powerful, uh, interesting women. Yeah. So Paula Moderson Becker also has some beautiful work. Uh, probably the first time I've seen her work. We you, you know, his, you know her story? No, I, uh, mm. I, I, I read about her story recently. So that's, uh, I, I found it pretty interesting. Yeah, so so um, she was she was living essentially like on a hippie commune, right? They had those in, in at the turn of the century in, in Germany at that time, and they were artists and free thinking and all of these people living in in these communal like places. And she was living in one of those, and that's where that's where she made most of her work. But um, she. Um, she, you, know, you can see the children in her work, and and um, in the work on the left, which is this, which is her self portrait, you see she's pregnant, right? Um, unfortunately, it was this pregnancy that that was the end of her life, as she died in childbirth. You know, so um, her her life was cut short. So uh, Gabriel Munter is a um, you know another woman from this period of time, and you look at the work uh, uh, from 1906, Nightfall in Saint Cloud, and it's a landscape, but it's incredibly ex expressionistic. And um, it turns out that 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 uh, Gabriel Munter was the uh, the female partner to Vasily Kandinsky. And we, we always talk about Kandinsky and his development of non-representational painting, but really it was is something that a lot of people were getting involved in. And you can see her work at this time, 1906, was just when they were starting to know each other, um, uh, is incredibly abstracted the landscape. These this this couple over here, uh, Julinski and Werefkin, were both artists as well too, and they were part of with with um, Gabriel Munta and um, Wesley Kandinsky. They were part of a group called um, the Blue Rider. Right? These are some of her works. Kathy Cullitz is an amazing woman, Eileen. Uh, Kathy, her, her work is, when you see it in person, it's so emotionally gut-wrenching. Uh, she, she's, she's a painter, she's a printmaker, she's a sculptor, and, and most of the work that I've seen involves uh, human suffering. Um, and and she, she just captures it so poignantly. I know she, she grew up in Prussian Germany. Um, I know that she had lost her own son in one of the wars uh, and lost her brother earlier than that. And I think uh, be, being so in touch with um, the, those kind of feelings just it's really comes out in her work. She was also the wife of a doctor. Right, at this point too, so he was he was working with a, a lot of people who 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 had pain and suffering, and so that was part that was an essential part of her career. Do we have other of her works here? Not yet. So um, then uh, we go to. <laughs> you will get to that in a second. I just you only have a little bit left, by the way. So. Um, uh, Kathy Kulowitz kept on making works that that really showed up some of the pain and suffering that was going on, especially in Germany, and uh, uh, right through um, up until the beginning of the Nazi era, she was adamantly against you know the Nazis and and depicted them negatively. She was forced to stop painting. Right? She was you know the Nazis. Um, they, they prevented her from, from, from working anymore. So in another direction. <laughs> we, That's it. Let's, let's do a 180. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is uh, the time, right? There's a lot going on now. Yeah, Flor Florine Stedheimer has uh, like raucously joyous uh, 
color palette. Um, you, you see your work and it's, there's a lot going on. The colors are vibrant. Uh, she, she was somebody that re really didn't sell her work because she was, she was more of a socialite, I think, and uh, didn't, didn't have the, the need to, to sell it per se. But uh, you, you just look at some of the, the things that she's doing. It's pretty credible. The uh, Jewish Museum had a, an, a, a one an ex, a one person ex exhibit, and uh, it was pretty interesting to see the the breadth of her work. So the breadth of her work. As I love this Park one. This this one is um, Asbury Park. Um, back in the 20s uh, and it, if you look close you see a whole lot of people enjoying enjoying the beach scene uh, it, it's the people are multi-ethnic uh, there it's like the jazz era they're you know they're dancing they're having a great time so you look at it and you're like oh isn't that sweet but if you know about the history uh, Asbury Park was segregated at, the, at that point so I think that was her political commentary on uh, what was going on with seg segregation at the time. So mm. it's, she, she kind of has a bite to her work. It, it just looks all joyful and fun, but you know, maybe she's really saying something if you look into it. This so, is Hilma Op Clint. Uh, this, this particular photograph is from the Guggenheim's uh, one person show of that they had with uh, Hilma. Uh, I went with the group of people and it was just, uh, her, her work was act just, it was breathtaking. You walked in um, and in this particular uh, setting, you see she's got, she had three walls and it was uh, childhood, uh, mid middle age, and then uh, older age. And she just portrayed them symbolically. Uh, it was really something to see. You, do you want to give some background on, she, she's an interesting person, but I'll let you do the background on I it. think you should. <laughs> we'll, we'll find, uh, hmm, okay. I mean, I, well, she was a, she was a mystic. Uh, her, her background in mysticism uh, is how she got into her painting. Uh, she would just kind of get in touch with with like the higher po power by uh, doing her artwork. Um, I think the she was into uh, was it theosophy? The theosophy, thank you. Mm, and uh, yeah. uh, very actually, Kandinsky was also a theosophist at one point. As was Adrian, yeah. And w what's interesting is she was doing this work totally independent. She would have no way of seeing their work. And she was doing it totally independent of them, and and her work predated theirs. And uh, some of the motivation and, and and the look of it is uh, is very similar. It's interesting how things in history can be done in tandem like that. So, so the Theosophical movement, which really began circa 1880, right? So it was essentially a new thing over the next couple of decades. Had some you know, the idea of being in touch with the mystical uh, as part of it, but it also encouraged people to like find their own vision, right? So a lot of visionary artists came from theosophy because they were, they were, they were feeling spiritual, but they did not want to like fit into any of the systems that already existed. This was the modern era and they were trying to, uh, trying to create a new sense of spirituality. And so um, that's the background of, of how so many of these artists got into this type of work from, from theosophy. It's interesting, you didn't, her work didn't come to uh, people's attention because uh, it was eventually all uh, gifted to her nephew after she passed with, mm -hmm. with the instructions that he was not allowed to show anybody the work until 20 years after her death. <laughs> so he had to hold on to it and, and couldn't share it. So really people didn't know of her existence per, per se, the larger world didn't know of it. And uh, she made a comment to her nephew that she wanted him to wait 20 years because she felt that the people of the future would understand her work more than the people of, of the day. 
<laughs> That's interesting. But it's funny because, you know, Hildegard's work look like, you know, look like this too, you know, so it's yeah. kind of, kind of an interesting thing that, you know, like, well, yeah. So, you know, another artist from around the same time whose work um, was non-representational um, was Sonia Delaunay. Now, most of us know the work, a particular work by her husband, Robert Delaunay, that's in, it's in MoMA, Simultaneous Contrast of, of um, Earth, what is it? The simultaneous contrast of the Earth and Moon, is it? The Sun and Moon, right? But um, these people, the two of them and some other artists were known as Orphists uh, because Orphe, Orphism, Orpheus was a demigod of music. And what they were trying to do here, Sonia and, and the others, was to create a sense of musicality in a non-representational work, right? So she's doing this at this, you know, the same time as Kandinsky's making his first non-representational works. And, all, you know, this, this is like starting to happen all over the place around this time, right? And... Um, the the other thing that she's fascinated with is the idea of the golden mean and she divides the canvas up and, and breaks it up. But if you look at the work on the left, you know, it's almost like um, that central line, if you were to pluck it, it would be like a bowstring and the music would be bouncing out from it. And that's something that she was trying to do with her music. So in this like decade, you know, um, this time just before World War I and, and into it, we find a whole number of women who are considered as avant-garde as any of the men of the time, Sonia Delaunay, uh, Natalia Goncharova is in, um, in Russia, and, you know, she's first doing this, this kind of um, uh, uh, post-impressionist type of work, Gauguin work, like in uh, the fishing, fishing, but um, the rapidly Cubism kind of crashes upon the world and it's the work in a Cubist style by 1913. Right. And then another artist from, from uh, Russia, Luyabov Popova. And again, we can see the, the Cubist influences and the objects from a dyer shop. And within a couple of years into the pure abstraction, the painterly architectonics, right? And um, she was like working with, it says constructivism, but also suprematism um, were, were movements at the same time. And they were works of, of pure non-representation. And these were all going on as just at the verge of the of the Russian Revolution. Um, back in in Switzerland, um, uh, Sophie Tauber Arp is the wife of, of Jean Arp, but also in her own right, she was a uh, a a painter and a, a um, designer. So she actually designed um, uh, clothing as well too. So. Uh, Delaunay did as well. She took her works and, and put them on textiles for women yeah. to wear. Interesting. Mm -hmm. how, yeah. how, how the females are in touch with, with that and, and will kind of de decorate and the some of the form. And some of even the idea of making the non-representational work came from the idea of textile design as well, too. You know, so they were already designing fabrics before, me, before they were making paintings. And uh, so... Um, that led to that as well, too. Um, another Dadaist is Hannah Hock, and we're really moving into a new era with this in the post-World War uh, One era. And uh, uh, Hock is noted for creating the concept of a photo montage, right? And her work is all post-World War I, but she was vehemently opposed to the uh, you know, the policies of the German uh, government during World War I and was a social critic, but she, but none of the artists could work during World War I. So afterwards, all of these things came out and she's like talking about the craziness of the world that brought on World War I and, and uh, cut with a kitchen knife. And then the multimillionaire 1923 is an exploration of, of how, um, how um, corporate uh, entities ended up 
causing World War One, and you know you could see the rubber tire, you know, and the the, uh, the idea that you know it ended up uh, artists ended up feeling, and most people did that that World War One was unnecessary, and the only people who who profited from it were, were major companies who were multinational and working both sides of it. So uh, we see these things uh, later on. Her work will start to explore gender identity, and she'll be more noted with the surrealists, which I will probably cover a little bit of in the next time. But the last artist we have for today is George O'Keefe, Eileen. And probably one of the most famous female artists. If I said to you, okay, name five female artists, I'm sure Georgia would be on top of the list. Uh, you know, her, her beautiful flower pieces and uh, her, her things from uh, New Mexico, they're just, they're iconic. I think they're recognized by everybody. Um, what, one thing that I think is interesting, she was having a conversation with an interviewer who said, um, you know, your, your uh, female genitalia uh, symbolism is quite heavy in, in a lot of your work. And uh, it's something that, that O'Keefe totally denied, uh, which I think is very interesting, especially when you look at the picture on the, on the right. Um, you know, she said that that you might want to look at it that way, but that's not what it's about. So, <laughs> so Alfred Stieglitz wanted it to be about that. He was trying to use that as a selling point. Yeah, it's you know, it, but I mean, it, Judy Chicago has no shame when it comes to that. She was uh, she Judy was, Chicago. <laughs> she was right there. So, <laughs> right. Uh, to to bring it full circle. Well, you yeah, know, the left. other thing, the other thing about Georgia O'Keefe that we should really know is like her background, right? She um, was born in the Midwest and um, as a young, as a young woman, she went to Texas and became a school teacher. You know, she traveled all by herself. And then when she decided to, she came to New York and she met up with the, the modern artists of, of New York City. Right. And then, then of course, she married Alfred Stieglitz, but decided that she would rather live in Taos, New Mexico. So she spent half the year with Stieglitz and half the year alone in Taos. She was definitely a woman who was of, of that period of time when, uh, when, when uh, they, there was that small group of women who were becoming um, uh, really um, modern. You know, so uh, she was one of those first modern, modern women, as well as were most of these uh, avant-garde artists was, we've just finished looking at, right? And um, that's where we were going to stop. We're going to look next, ne in two weeks, we're going to look at some of the artists of the 30s, uh, um, the photographers, the, the, uh, the surrealists, and, and move into the, into the, uh, the 40s and 50s with the abstract expressionist and some of some of the ones that you know were really important to me were the artists of, of the of the late 60s like Jackie Windsor so I'd like to show some of her work and then of course we'll we'll be talking a lot more about feminism in art in two weeks so that's what we have for you today thank you Eileen that was thank fun thank you this was very fun thanks for mm -hmm. hanging in there Okay. Yeah. And, and good thing I didn't put any more slides on there because we're already a half hour over <laughs> somehow or other. It, oh, it always goes over. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Okay. And have a good night. I also Thank you. Thank you everybody. You can, if you want to just uh, remind everybody about your Monday. Oh, next Monday. Next Monday. Thank you, I did mention it during it. Next, fabulous. next Monday. We're going to be having uh, Jane Hartley live. She's the, her work is currently in the Pat Med Library, and it's really beautiful. You can see it some of it on our, our website. And she's like um, she uses uh, a Baroque style of painting.